Mr. McBride. Hello, is this Sarah? Um, this is Sarah. Um, that was Rachel. Um, she's also working on the project um, on the Allen Building takeover with me. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you so much for agreeing to speak with us. Um, we really want to really know more about the specific details of the protest because we found that when sharing like elements of the protest with our class, that's what really grabs people and what really makes this protest feel um, real and as significant as it truly was. Um, so thank you so much again. You're welcome. I hope I can be of some help. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we really appreciate you taking time out of your day uh, to speak with us. And, and like Sarah said, we're we're really looking for like some more big human elements of this. It's been really kind of hard for us to juggle what it would be like to do this at 17 and 18, um, like some of the students were at that point, and kind of placing ourselves like in your shoes. I understand that we might ask you to recall things that happened 50 plus years ago. Um, so I don't remember is a totally relevant answer. Um, and don't let us ask things that are, you know, kind of outside of the purview there. Okay. Okay, awesome. Um, so the first thing we kind of wanted to think about is the planning stages of this and um, kind of what factors went into the decision to take over the building and kind of the structural components of that. Um, as the president of the Afro Am Society, what was your role in the planning? That's very hard to, hard to remember. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, because, uh, what, what I learned in, uh, in getting back together with the other protesters was that there seemed to be no one uh, person who did it. Mm -hmm. um, Charles Hopkins, uh, Chucky Hopkins, mm -hmm. was the person who was president of Afro-Am before I was, and, and he was the founding president. And uh, he was two classes ahead of me. But there was, I guess my, my biggest role was as, a, I was a, a catalyst for the direct action. Mm -hmm. Because when I ran for president, uh, when I say ran for president, I was nominated in a meeting, and mm -hmm. had to give a speech. And I, in my speech, I, I, I really kind of was trying to take the cow's way out of being president. So I gave a speech that I thought would turn people off. <laughs> it, was, it, it, was, it was exactly what I felt, but I thought that uh, people would not go for it. And I said that if I was elected president, uh, my administration would be one of accelerated militancy. And they liked that. <laughs> It, uh, it went along with what uh, Chuck said was happening uh, to him that year was that students were coming to him and saying that we needed to do something. Mm -hmm. And my election indicated that they did want to do, do direct action, uh, that they were uh, impatient with what had not been happening uh, as far as uh, the school administration was concerned. So my role was uh, as a catalyst and uh, as a uh, I guess a, 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 a motivator. Absolutely. Do you remember who your main role models or intellectual mentors were to come in and advocate accelerated militancy, even if it was kind of to try and turn people off? Like that's a that's a full throated philosophy to kind of put forth. Do you remember like reading something that that really got that ball rolling for you or anybody that you really looked up to in that type of organizing model? Well, I, I looked up to Stokely Carmichael hmm. um, at the uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to be a member of SNCC, but I was I was in the wrong place. I was in a small town mm. in in Georgia, and I was uh, younger than the SNCC people were. Uh, but I liked I liked their provocative language. Mm -hmm. uh, I liked the language of black power. I liked the um, 
I like that they were confrontational and did not um, did not fear what white people might do to them. Right. And do you remember the decision to have a protest in the Allen Building? That when you decided that you wanted the um, accelerated militancy to take place in this form. Do I remember what? Um, when you decided that your form of action would be taking over the Allen building. That, that I don't remember. Mm -hmm. And uh, from my conversations, I don't know if anybody remembers exactly. Right. Uh, it, I think we had a meeting and, and, and uh, perhaps it was a committee that said, okay, we're going to take over Allen building. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't. I just don't remember. Uh, I only remember one meeting about it, and that was the meeting the night before we actually went into the building. I don't remember uh, any of the other meetings, but there were, I think, several meetings where uh, where the planning was done. What was discussed the night before? Like, what was the general mood of the group? Do you remember what parts of it were most exciting to you? Well, the night before, we met at a house off campus, mm -hmm. and uh, we talked about what we would what we would do the next day, what time we were going uh, to hit the building, how we were going to get there. Uh, mm -hmm. That's when we learned that we would um, ride over to Allen Building in a U-Haul truck, mm. uh, and uh, each each person got their assignments as to what they would do. There were there was a group that would go first who would uh, encourage the people working in the building to leave the building, and uh, they were you know they were instructed that there would be no violence, not to touch anybody. Uh, as a Turns out, I think that somebody did perhaps verbally abuse uh, some some of the women who worked there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there were people who were assigned to secure the doors after we entered the building, mm -hmm. um, and there were someone rented the truck, someone drove the truck. Uh, and uh, we discussed uh, whether we would take weapons into the building. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the leadership, including me, was, was strongly opposed to that. Uh, we just didn't think that was, that was wise. We were, we were black folks living in the South. disaster. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought, we thought we might, uh, we actually thought it was a real possibility we might be killed anyway. Mm -hmm. But uh, some people said we were brave, but uh, that's not a good word. We were not, we were not brave, we were, we were young. Mm -hmm. And so and naive and uh, didn't too young to be afraid, um, mm. to put it that way. I'm really interested by kind of the different factions of this group dynamic. So I could be totally projecting here, but we spoke with Mike LeBlanc and he kind of placed himself inside of what he called a radical faction. And so I'm imagining that those are the people who might be like, yeah, sure. Like let's bring guns into the building. Like we, this is the revolution. Like he, he was very adamant that that's how he kind of saw his role as one of the younger members of this group. Um, and then we had, we spoke with Janice Williams, who as a first year at the time was saying like, Oh no, it, it, it was really exciting. Right. Like I, I trusted the people that we were going in with, and I mean, I had assignments that were that were left over from me shirking off my responsibility from Black Week. So I remember like taking books and whatnot. Um, can you describe kind of what, how different people were approaching this event, and like the responsibility that you felt as a leader and kind of somebody who was trying to manage all these people? Well, uh, in terms of. Uh 
radical faction. It was it was easy for me to manage the radical faction because I was part of it. Hmm. <laughs> so uh, it if I said we were not going to take guns in, and I was uh, one of the leaders of the radical faction, then it was okay for other folks to say, okay, we won't do that. Mm. Uh, there, there was a, there was a, I mean, there was, there was a group of students that, uh, that did not want me to be president because they didn't want direct action. Mm. Uh, so, Chucky was saying that once grades came out, that, that motivated a lot of people. Um, they just thought something else need to, needed to be done, and so they were more willing to, to, to do this. There were students who, who didn't go in who were willing to support us uh, in other ways, mm-hmm. like uh, getting supplies to us or uh, communicating, so forth and so on. Mm-hmm. But uh, I don't know how long the gun discussion went. I, if my memory serves me correct, I, I just remember saying that we're not going to take guns in because uh, uh, if we take guns in, we're going to die, and nobody's going to even care. Uh, we may die without guns, but if we die without guns, at least somebody will have sympathy for us. Right. Do you remember what type of... Oh. I'm sorry? <laughs> I said LeBlanc may have been a hothead. Mm. <laughs> he certainly identifies that way, I would say, just from our short conversation with him. Do you remember what types of responsibilities you had during the hours you were in there, or was it mostly as an administrator making sure everybody else was doing kind of their assigned task? I remember very little. Uh, I remember directing students not to talk to the press through the windows. Mm. Uh, we wanted to control the communication. And uh, Tony Axum uh, recommended that I dissolve all the officers, mm. all the officers, uh, so that uh, nobody could be targeted as a leader of the operation. So I did that. As far as... Uh, Managing other things, Chucky took a uh, took the primary role there in communicating with the administration mm-hmm. and in making some assignments uh, in the building. And about the students that both participated in the protest and were willing to help outside of it, even though it wasn't everyone, it's still a significant number of the black students there, and I don't think since then we've had a protest that has really been as big. What do you think motivated that many students to participate? Well, many of them felt they were treated quite badly at Duke. Mm-hmm. Um, Yeah, they were, uh, uh, I guess there were attempts at humiliation in the, in the classroom. Uh, people felt that uh, they were not graded fairly. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had an incident, well, it wasn't, this was after, this was like maybe a year or two after Allen Billing, mm-hmm. when it's the only time that I protested a grade that I got. I got a, a low grade in one of my uh, upper, level, upper level physics courses. And my professor was a, uh, a visiting professor from Italy. Mm. And uh, I told him, I said, well, you know, I may not have done well in your class. I can agree with that. But, you know, all the grades were posted. I said, but... I see other folks who didn't do any more than I did, and they got better grades than I got. And he said, you're right. He said, I apologize. He said, I think that I let the department influence me and not treat you fairly because um, they don't like you in the department and they don't want you here. Jeez. 
was. So now that could have been because I'd already, you know, raised hell. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there were there were students who felt uh, that they were getting that kind of treatment before we went in, mm -hmm. before we went into Allen Building. And oh, by the way, that professor did change my grade. Oh, very yeah, good. Yeah, I'm yeah. happy to hear that. <laughs> when you went into the Allen Building, how did you feel? Was it just a focus on what you had to do? Janice described it as excitement, but I don't know if that feeling was the same for everyone. Uh, I guess I, 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 yeah, I guess I felt some excitement. I, I, as, uh, some apprehension, you know, didn't know what, how the university would respond. Uh, although I thought that we may be in the building, I thought we would stay in the building at least 24 hours. Mm -hmm. I didn't expect to be out so soon. Um, so I was preparing to settle in for a, a much longer stay. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't think I was going to a party. <laughs> Were you expecting the administration to respond the way that they did? Expecting the ultimatums, the eventual, like, bringing in of the National Guard? I don't, I, I don't know. You know, I don't know what I, ex what I expected. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't remember what I expected. I don't remember if I was surprised that they called the police. I just don't remember, remember that. Um, I... I just remember that I didn't want to be in there when the police came in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Do you recall if you ever took a, participated in the vote that was like, that uh, I think Beck on the panel was talking about that he was counting votes for? Like, were you always in the camp to leave? I don't remember. I don't remember the, I don't remember the vote. Gotcha. I just remember that. Like, I don't remember that there were only 20-some out of us left. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember walking, uh, I remember getting to the door behind Chucky, somewhere behind Chucky, and the door being locked, and then the door being unlocked. And I was going out of, out of the door, the face was Perkins. I remember that. I don't remember the vote. I don't remember how I voted. Mm -hmm. Uh, I probably voted to voted to leave because, mm. like I said, I didn't want to be in there when the cops came in. Right. They had riot gear and everything else. Something that we learned and kind of didn't really appreciate until we saw the exhibit in Perkins. By the way, did you get to see that while you were on campus? Uh, not really. I, I went in there, but I didn't really look at anything okay. much. Okay. No worries. Um, Something that they, I think, highlighted pretty well was the fact that students described the first floor of Alton Building while you were in there as Malcolm X Liberation School, um, paying homage to, to Howard Fullard's um, work in Durham and the university that he set up there. And I guess that that piece of it has kind of been lost in like historical coverage of it, right? It's it's always the Allen Building takeover. It's 20 years since, it's 30 years since, it's 50 years since. And I'm wondering if, maybe this is something that Chuck could speak to more, but I'm wondering if you know if that was something that was more important for y'all to identify with kind of internally or something you wanted people to understand, like that's that's how you were referring to the, the activism that was going on. Uh, I don't know. Hmm. Uh, I can't speak much to that. Uh, uh, I think it was... Uh, I associate Vic Jordan with that, and that may not be correct. It seemed to me that it was uh, spontaneous <laughs> that uh, that we did that, but I'm, I'm not certain. And I think I asked you a little bit about this when we briefly met in the interview room, but what were you focusing on with communicating 
the message of the protest, um, like with making sure that students didn't speak to the press, what message did you want to send? Well, the first thing we wanted uh, people to know was that we were not in there to destroy anything. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't want to give the authorities an excuse uh, to come in and, and bash heads. Um, we wanted the focus to be on our demands. So, um, and that was what, that was another reason for, uh, not, uh, the plan was not to hurt anybody, not to damage any property, not to destroy any records. Um, although, uh, at least one reporter, uh, fabricated that story. I think some somebody from the Durham Sun fabricated a story that we that we had weapons and that we had uh, incendiary devices or whatever, and we were going to burn records and that kind of thing. We we didn't we wanted to control the message that got out, and we didn't want anybody to talk to the press, and we wanted to focus on the demands. So that's why Chucky communicated the, the demands to. Uh, can't call his name now. Uh, Dean Griffith? Right, Dean Griffith. Gotcha. And, um, and we wanted to, uh, we wanted all the communication to go that, go that way. Mm. So we didn't, so not even, not even I spoke to, uh, to Dean Griffith. We wanted, we wanted one, one voice going out. Mm. I guess I'm wondering, something that other students have, or former protesters rather, have touched on is like the power of Howard Fuller and Ben Ruffin coming into the building and that as like a turning point for the group and understanding the gravity of the situation that they were in and how precarious their situation was. It sounded like throughout you very much knew how dangerous this enterprise was. Um, do you remember them coming in or do you remember how you felt seeing them? I, I don't remember their coming in. Mm. Um, I, I always appreciated that it was that it was dangerous. I I can imagine that when they came in, that that would have been um, sobering for for anybody who was not sober already. Mm. Um, we at least I did. And I think most most of the students did. Uh, really looked up to them and appreciated their support and the support of the uh, uh, black community in, in Durham. They were very, very supportive. And uh, uh, we would we would listen to them. Mm -hmm. During the day of the Allen Building protest, are there any conversations or specific moments that you really remember now because they were so salient or striking to you at the time? I, I remember the three things that stick in my mind. I, I, I wish I could remember this this guy's name. There was a there was a white student. He left Duke and went to Sarah Lawrence. Mm -hmm. Cause at, the, at the time, Sarah Lawrence had been all female and they changed over. But he was, uh, I cannot remember his name. I think he was from New Jersey. But he was uh, very supportive in terms of uh, uh, he and uh, some other white students who uh, brought us food mm -hmm. uh, and asked what else, you know what could they do to to help. And uh, I remember the I remember the report as I said uh, from the. Uh, from the reporter who claimed that he came into the building, that we let him into the building, that he saw these things, mm -hmm. that he saw weapons and so forth and so on. I remember that. Uh, I remember that because that, you know, that put us in jeopardy. Mm -hmm. And I remember Tony saying, Mike, you got to dissolve the officers. We, got, we can't have any officers because uh, the 
universal will target uh, the leaders. So those those are the things that stick out of my mind. Oh yeah, and I remember Bill trying to sit him by the by the door, having secured the, the door that we entered, the double wooden doors. Mm-hmm. The rest of it is a, is a blur, except for actually leaving out of the truck. Mm-hmm. The, I remember the, you know, it was dark in the truck, and then there was light, ran out, ran to the building. Wow. Do you remember exiting the building um, and where you went kind of in the immediate aftermath? Uh, yeah, I remember ex- exiting the building. Uh, as I said, the doors, doors, the doors were locked when we got there. And uh, Janet remembers the guy who unlocked the doors for us. The doors were unlocked, and we walked out the door that faces Perkins mm-hmm. uh, with our fist raised. And I went over to Canterbury, mm-hmm. which is going straight across from Allenville. Mm-hmm. I don't know which room I went to, but I remember going uh, into Canterbury, and I think it was a Vic, Vic Jordan's room, uh, and watching what was going on. And I remember calling up. Parents, although I don't, I don't. That's kind of odd because we didn't have cell phones then. Right. I don't know what phone I used, but I remember calling my parents at some point uh, because I knew they would see this on the news, hmm. and I wanted to let them know that I was okay. And then you know, we watched, uh, we watched them tear gas uh, the students who were around the building mostly white students. How did it feel watching them tear gas the students? Um, I don't know. I, I, I think in a way I thought that that would uh, radicalize those students. That they would, that they would be angry that that the police were tear gassing them when they were just, well, some of them, they weren't all just watching. Some were opposed to the police being in the beginning. Mm-hmm. You know, so some of them were probably taunting, taunting the police, but many of them were there just out of curiosity. And uh, I, I, may have, uh, I may have felt good that they got tear gassed. I, I really don't know. Uh, you know, good, good in, in the sense that um, they see that that the authorities uh, don't care about them so much either, mm. and you know they they can they can see that uh, that their their skin won't protect them from the man. Right. That's a way of putting it. We were really moved by your openness and willing to share on the first panel kind of what the lasting effects of the protest were on you in the immediate aftermath and that like there was a there was a very real cost for not just putting yourself in danger one time but assuming some responsibility for what was going to happen to other students and understanding that like the university was willing to put you in physical danger, right? Can you talk a little bit more about what that was like for you? Uh, I had uh, I had close friends who, who did not come back uh, after that year, and I felt some uh, some responsibility for that because uh, I could have I could have called off the boycott mm-hmm. earlier, um, and you know there's a lot a lot of second second guessing should I have. Should I have, should I have called it off mm-hmm. sooner? Uh, wasn't my responsibility, or you know, you know, they could have, they could have made a decision to break the boycott, mm-hmm. but, but they, but they didn't out of solidarity mm-hmm. uh, with the rest.
rest of us did not break the boycott. And I myself didn't break the boycott. Um, so I, I guess I, I, I felt some guilt uh, that uh, some of them had to leave, leave the university. Could you describe to us for the boycott and why you felt it was important to keep it going as long as you did? We, we felt that the boycott would pressure, pressure the university because uh, it would look, the university would look bad if, if, if all the black students left. Mm. Uh, that it would uh, expose expose Duke as a as a racist institution mm-hmm. that uh, that they they would bring us bring us there and then not do what was necessary to uh, support us in, in being successful there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a boycott a boycott of classes is kind of a It's it's one of those things that as a as an old man uh, I I wouldn't do, hmm. but as a young man I, I was willing to do. Uh, looking back on it, it seems like one of those things that you know you you, you punish yourself. Hmm. Uh, but we were we weren't thinking so much of ourselves as uh, those who would come after. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's, we weren't, you know, we didn't have, we didn't have families uh, to support. We weren't thinking of, uh, at least I wasn't, I wasn't thinking of the sacrifice that my parents mm-hmm. made to get me there. Um, and that, you know, it may be counterproductive not to go to class. Mm-hmm. Uh, We felt, and it, and, and it was and it was validated uh, at our trial. We felt that if we stuck together, mm-hmm. that we could uh, pressure the university and get and get what we were after, uh, and that by all of us doing it, that that would protect us. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, st- sticking together uh, uh, as a as a tactic. Oh, was validated when uh, the uh, when we went to trial. Mm-hmm. You know, those people who uh, played uh, who didn't play a leading role mm-hmm. in in the takeover uh, all played with us. Mm-hmm. And so university felt that they couldn't punish those people like they would punish the leaders. Mm-hmm. And since they didn't know who had really done what, they were reluctant to uh, apply the ultimate punishment to us and gave us essentially a slap on the wrist. Mm-hmm. Did your parents know you were going into the building before you did? No, my parents did not. Mm-hmm. It did not occur to me tell them. Right. How much did you talk to them in the the rest of the semester, like as you're trying to keep this boycott together, as you're preparing for the trial, as you're, you know, being a student and studying for exams at the end of the semester? I don't recall that I talked to them very much. I did uh, I did let them know that, uh, that I had been charged and that we were going to trial, and my dad came uh, came up to Duke mm. for the trial. He, when when I called him after after the takeover to let him know I was okay, he asked me, you know, what was I going to do? Uh, I said, I don't know. He said, Well, you pack your stuff and come on home. Mm. And uh, I said, Okay, but I had no intention of doing that, <laughs> and, I, and I didn't. Why was it so important for you to stay? Uh, because the fight wasn't over. Mm. You know, 
um, you, you have to see it. You have to see it through to the end. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you can't you can't start something and not finish it, especially something like that. I mean, if it if it's a, if it's important enough to start, it's important enough to finish. Mm-hmm. And it was it was important to us, and and uh, you know, it's been validated. Uh, it's been validated through the years. Mm-hmm. I, I I have a a physician, uh, well, my personal physician, some years ago, uh, I had a daughter who came to Duke, mm-hmm. and he said, "I want to thank y'all for what you did." Mm-hmm. Wow. Um, how long was the boycott? I don't remember. It was. Uh, I I don't remember. It was long enough to. Flock out the engineering students. Mm-hmm. Wow. <laughs> they were the they were the ones who were uh, who were uh, uh, encouraging me to to end the boycott. Right. Mm-hmm. But 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 they didn't want to break it. Mm-hmm. You know, so they, they felt that they there was it was harder for them to catch up than it would be for. Trinity students. Right. In in like the following years, both while you were at Duke and kind of in the aftermath, um, can you talk a little bit about what you would consider to be like the greatest victory of the boycott? Like one of the demands that was met from the takeover or even something not connected to the takeover that you worked on during your time at Duke and maybe one thing that you're disappointed to see is still a problem with Duke? Oh, I want you to ask that question again. Of course. Um, so I guess we're looking for one thing you're really proud of and one thing maybe you're a little bit more ashamed of that Duke still has. So one thing you're proud of that that you feel you push the needle on, so that could be um, the like the founding of the Black Studies and later the Department of African and African American Studies. That can be the fact that the Mary Lou Williams Center exists now. It could be that black student population has increased significantly since the 70s, like has continued to increase and is now more or less commensurate to the national population, but not to the state of North Carolina. Um, So what types of things you take pride in that you count as a victory? And then what parts of Duke you think still have a long way to go? Well, I am, I am uh, proud that we have a, a, a black studies program. I'm, I'm, I'm proud of the, of the diversity that I see in the, in the student body at, mm-hmm. at Duke, not just black students, but uh, all students. I mean, Duke. This is when I when I uh, watch the basketball games, or when mm-hmm. I see uh, the Duke magazine, uh, I'm really pleased at, at the diversity that I see. And I, 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 I had. My feelings about Duke were not so good. I, I didn't. I didn't realize how uh, ambivalent I was about Duke until about. Uh, do you remember the, the Duke lacrosse? Oh thing? yeah. Uh, not long after that happened, I was part of a focus group uh, in the Atlanta area that, that Duke had. Uh, they had. And it was, it was all black students. Mm. They had a focus group, and uh, I was the oldest one mm. there. And the young, the young alumni were were very positive about Duke, about the experience they had. Wow. Um, I remember one young woman saying. She could not understand how anyone who finished Duke could not support the school because she had a great experience and she would always support it so that others could have the kind of experience that she had. And mm-hmm. she, she she convinced me <laughs> to uh, start contributing wow. to the alumni fund. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the but you could you could tell how young 
the alumni were mm -hmm. based on how positive their experiences were because yeah. mine was the most negative and then the next oldest person was a little less negative mm -hmm. and then you know they, they became positive so uh that that it, that made me feel good and, and that uh that took away a lot of my negative feelings about about the school i didn't i didn't realize how negative i felt about it how negatively i felt about it until uh there was a, a black alumni function here in atlanta not long before that mm -hmm. and i went to that function and i felt out of place mm -hmm. i felt like it wasn't wasn't my school and i didn't really talk to anybody much i, I said you know I didn't realize how negatively I felt about Duke until I came to this thing. Wow. Uh, so I, I feel much better about it now. Uh, I, I love when I when I uh, see all different hues of people when I go to Duke. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't go there right. when I see it. Mm -hmm. you know, that that makes me feel good, and I feel like what we did. Had, had a lot to do with making Duke diversify. Mm. Do you sometimes wonder if Duke would be better for current black students or recent black alums if you hadn't been so direct and militant in your no, methods? No, I don't. No, mm. no. I think I think Duke had to be pushed. Uh, all institutions have to be have to be pushed. Mm -hmm. uh, even even so-called liberal institutions, mm -hmm. uh, institutions uh, start to institutions forget their missions, and they start to uh, exist solely to exist. Mm -hmm. They they want to. They just want to perpetuate themselves. Mm -hmm. They just want to live. It's, it's, it's almost like an organism. It just wants. It just wants to live. Mm -hmm. And so, anything that threatens, that threatens it, mm -hmm. threatens its existence as it sees it, uh, it will uh, push against that. So Duke was uh, one kind of school when we went there, and it's a different kind of school now. Mm -hmm. uh, Duke was a a regional university at the time. Um, it's uh, literature boasted that it had the 19th largest library uh, in the country, at least among universities. Uh, but it was not the national university that it is now. Mm. And I think that is responsible for, uh, at least played a, played a, a big role in what, in what Duke has become. And um, with the commemoration of the events and just the way that Duke has treated the memory of the Allen Building takeover over time, um, how has that felt for you as you've watched over 50 years Duke change its view on the takeover? Uh, it, it doesn't. That doesn't excite me. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't know that. Well, it's hard to speak of. I'm, well, let me say. This. I'm. I'm glad that that they did this. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that there are elements. In the university, that would not think so positively of that, mm -hmm. and that's okay. It's a it's a large institution. You got various factions, and that's 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 fine. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad they did uh, that. They recognized it. Uh, but I don't get real excited about it. Yeah, I don't blame you. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, and what were your impressions of the commemoration events, of the panels, and being able to reunite with a lot of the other protesters? Uh, it was good to see everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, when it was first mentioned to me, I had to, I had to think a little bit about where I would come. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when I decided that I would come, I was enthusiastic, enthusiastic about coming. And it was it was great to see folks, and uh, it was we had a few phone meetings uh, mm -hmm. before, and uh, it was interesting. The first one was very cautious because we had talked to, to each other in so many years, and mm -hmm. we didn't remember who we liked and who we didn't like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, and then you know, after by the time we got around to the last meeting, you know, everybody had loosened up, and mm -hmm. it was. It was it was great. It was great to see everybody. I I, I regret that more people did not return. Mm. What made you decide to come after being unsure? Uh, I I guess cat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it was uh, her asking and. Her indicating to the other people that they were trying to get to come, that that uh, that made me made me come. Mm -hmm. And I really liked um, what you said about how you've been able to meet people and see like how important this protest was for our university. Um, but I was wondering if there was ever a time where you wondered if something was going to come out of it. Um, and if like the university really would respond in a way that like bettered the experience for students. Well, uh, immediately afterwards, I guess for the next couple of years mm -hmm. that was there. You know, we didn't we didn't know uh, we didn't know whether whether the university would would make a serious effort to. Uh, do the things we, we thought should be done. Now they they did uh, uh, they did a summer transitional program. They did that right away. Mm -hmm. uh, the but the the black studies that was that was uh, that's kind of a mix. That's kind of a mixed bag mm -hmm. uh, because. We had see there was a, there was a, there was a struggle uh, with the with the faculty over defining how uh, or what black studies would be, mm. what African American studies would be, and uh, you know even even professors who who supported us did not support. Uh, our desire to define the content of the program. Mm -hmm. uh, so this institution was going to was going to protect itself, and the faculty was going to protect. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what they saw as their purview to to define what's taught in the university. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, in a sense, in a sense, we in a sense we failed. Uh, in, a, in a sense, we you know we got a we got a black studies program. We may not have gotten the program that we want, and I can't really speak much to that because I don't really know what the black studies program is like. Mm -hmm. uh, I had, I never had an intention of uh, majoring in black studies, mm -hmm. uh, but I thought it was I thought there should be. A department, mm -hmm. uh, and we we did Duke did uh, bring in some uh, some great black scholars. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know that that was good. That was good. 
And how has the takeover affected your life afterwards? Has it affected the way you've approached your career or your studies after the takeover um, or your, your relationship with other people? Uh, I don't know when, I'm not sure when the FBI started uh, uh, watching me, but they they did. Uh, did, you, did you, you guys knew that, right? No, no we, we did, did not. not. <laughs> uh, Kat told me she saw, she saw something in the Perkins exhibit about, about that. Mm. That, uh, she said she knew, she knows that she saw my name and Tony Axel's name and, and uh, Chuck Hawkins' name. Mm-hmm. I, I found out when I got ready to leave, to leave Durham, uh, mm-hmm. I was uh, working at the post office and uh, one of my roommates uh, had applied, from undergraduate school, had applied to the government for a job and he put me down as a, as a job reference. Mm-hmm. <laughs> The FBI came by the post office, and uh, this was a couple of years after I finished. Mm-hmm. I was waiting for my wife to finish graduate mm-hmm. school, and uh, he said to me, "I heard you were leaving town soon, so I rushed right down here." Wow. I said, "How did you know I was leaving town soon?" He said, well, "I guess I pick it up somewhere." And then he said, he started asking me about people I knew. He said, well, what's Tony Axon doing? I said, well, how do you know Tony Axon? And so he told me, he said, well, you know, we watched all of you guys. And we, we kept files on you. Wow. I said, why? He said, well, we didn't know where your loyalties were. And until that happened to me, I thought that we were all flattering ourselves. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The FBI was keeping files on us. Right. Yeah. But we weren't. They, they were. Uh, I, I've i heard that they were. Uh, that they kept files on a lot of black students at, at white colleges. Mm-hmm. Uh, Fortunately, that hasn't affected me as, uh, uh, you know, afterwards. Mm-hmm. That was just, it was just, um, just shows you what, you know, what the, how we, how we were viewed, viewed by the, by the government. Mm-hmm, of course. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I didn't. I didn't have a, I didn't have a career in physics, uh, but but I can't I can't blame it on on uh, well in a sense I can I, I, I focus more on on protests than I did on my studies. Uh, although I did have a chance, uh, they wanted to hire me at the EPA mm-hmm. in the research triangle, and I was about to be hired Mm -hmm. and the morning that I was going to be hired as I was taking a tour of the facility uh, President Nixon froze federal hiring Uh and I couldn't I couldn't be hired Mm -hmm. (laughs) very lucky Mm -hmm. Um, but the new degree has been I mean uh, that that uh, that impresses people Mm -hmm. Uh, some people are easily impressed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what we're hoping for, certainly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are there any untold stories, you think, about the Allen Building takeover? Any part of the takeover or experience that you think deserves more focus when we remember it? Well, what do you remember? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think... I guess something that we've been thinking about a lot in kind of the weekends events that that kind of like that students have the opportunity to go to um, and the exhibit that they might see in Perkins and the Chronicle just in the last two months has published like a whole six part series on the Allen building. So there's one piece that's like a timeline of the day's events. There's one piece that's about um, 
like Allen Building protesters, where are they now? And they did little mini profiles of a couple of y'all. Um, there's one that's about the history of protest at Duke and how the Allen Building continues to be like um, kind of something that people aim at, but also that they organize around as a space. And so we've been thinking about how it's surprising to people in our class, for example, to understand y'all as students, right? To think about like the fact that you might have brought in books or were calling your parents during this time and also we're managing classes, right? Because there's a way that we are the last generation of Duke students who might be able to call you up on the phone, right? And hear about exactly how taxing this process was. Um, and there's a certain urgency that we feel to try and document like, like that, that you were doing this to, to seek some justice for yourself and for your peers and for people that you were studying with and who you loved, right? But also understanding that like Duke wasn't going to get better without your time. And like, it's sad that you had to focus on protests and not physics when there were white students in the physics department at the time, right? Who were just going along their merry way. And so I, like, I guess those parts of it weren't obvious to us until we had the opportunity to hear directly from y'all and like, and it felt like every quote, especially in that first panel, like people were kind of looking around, especially people who weren't there and were kind of shocked by it. Just like the very, very human elements of this story. Um, you know, uh, well, not, this is going to sound really strange. Okay. <laughs> You know, I, I, I went to, uh, I grew up in segregated Georgia. I went to a segregated mm -hmm. high school. Uh, I, I, uh, when, when I drove up, uh, when my dad drove me up on, on Deuce campus and I saw those towers, it looked like the towers were moving behind the trees and stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was that was like Hogwarts. <laughs> I, I mean, it was just, it just blew my mind. I, and I thought I was, you know, I was coming to a, a, a community of scholars and we'd be sitting up at night having intellectual conversations and, and this is mm. what I thought I was coming to. Mm. And, you know, I, w I was very naive. I didn't know white people cursed. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I remember the I remember the shock of hearing uh, on West Campus the the upperclassmen and and the freshmen hollering across the quad at each other, uh, uh, saying uh, hit the books frosh and then the frosh would say up your ass upper class. Mm -hmm. And I I just didn't expect to see that. I didn't I didn't expect to see, I'd never seen people drunk before. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, but I still thought it was, you know, I, you know, it, it would be, it would be fine. I was, I was in a university. So what I, what I wanted and what many of us wanted, because we were all, you know, from, from where we came from, we were quote smart, unquote. Mm -hmm. And we thought we were going to, be around a bunch of smart folks and we're going to do smart things. Mm -hmm. And then you get, you got there and you found out that many of these smart people were bigots mm -hmm. and then didn't want to accept you as, as being smart and being a, a part of the university. So, you know, you, you, you could either you could either leave, mm -hmm. which which was admitting some kind of defeat, mm -hmm. or you could do what black people were doing uh, in other areas of life in, in America. You could fight, you could mm -hmm. protest, you could you could change it. So we we decided that we would that, that we had to change it. We couldn't run. And, you know, 
going to a black school. Mm-hmm. But we, 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 we couldn't do that. So uh, we decided to uh, we decided to, to, to fight and uh, you know other freedom riders made sacrifices. people lost their, lost their lives. So you know I could I could fail some classes. Mm. you know <laughs> uh, you know, that's, I didn't lose my life. I, I didn't have the uh, career I envisioned, but I may not have had that career anyway. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I still had a, I still have, uh, and I'm still having a, a good life, as far mm-hmm. as I'm concerned. Uh, so, I don't, I didn't see that I had a choice. I think many of us felt that we didn't have a choice. That's what black people had to do. You had to, you had to fight, and you win some battles, you lose some battles. But you know, the, the struggle goes on. You, you know, white white kids didn't it didn't affect them. They didn't see that it affected them, so they could they could uh, concentrate on their studies. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had to concentrate on my task. I just happened to have to do more than they had to do. I had to protest and try to get my my lessons. Yeah. Tell me about it. Well, I mean, as current students at Duke who are enjoying a, a much more, you're right, religiously, culturally, ethnically, religiously diverse community than you did, um, and as students who, like, were here as the 50th anniversary took place um, and get to see this exhibit in Perkins, um, there's one part of the exhibit where current students can put up their demands. Like there's a prompt that says, what are your demands? And there's a whole bunch of note cards where people can post them. And let me tell you, like current students are not holding back. Um, and they're very much invoking your legacy saying like, like Asian American students, for example, calling for their history to be taught in a way that is not reductive and that um, speaks to both like East Asian culture and like the Asian American experience here at Duke. Um, They're asking for the university to do more to protect undocumented students and the Durham community and how how many ICE raids have been increasingly closer to campus and how that necessarily affects people's ability to like go to class safely. And so I say all that to say that like it is very clear to us Mm -hmm. the direct impact you've had on our lives through like engaging and improving the university that we attend. Um, so like from the bottom of my heart, I really want to thank you for, for everything that you've done to make this place better and safer for us. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is, I mean, that kind of concludes like all the questions that we wanted to bother you with today. Um, and we've already taken up more of your time than, yeah, we, than we said that we would. But again, like thank you again for your time this evening and for, for everything you've done for yeah, this place. Yeah, thank you so much.